I think the issue that a lot of people have when it comes to should I build wealth is that sounds like a bad thing. It sounds like yeah. a very slimy thing. My goal is not to make you wealthy. My goal is to teach you how to use your money better. But also like one of the things I always emphasize is the relationship with money. Because the reality is we all spend money and earn money, but how do you build a healthy relationship with money? That's so interesting. So did you and Tom become friends from this whole thing? Yeah, I think... Um, like meeting him through all of this. Yeah, you know? so I, I first did an interview in LA with Lewis Howes. Mm. Um, did you like him? I did. Interesting guy. Um, and I from, like Tom better. Yeah. I think Tom is really smart and he's built something like really true. Yeah. You know, so I, I appreciate that. Like, yeah. He's, a, he's very, he, and he practices what he preaches. Like, yeah, yeah. He's so, so intense. Yeah. And so from actually the Lewis interview was how Tom found, found me. And so then I did an interview on Tom um, and that did well. And so I was asked to come back. And so we just kind of built like a, a you know, a relationship, just seeing him a handful of times. And then um, just kind of, you know, we hung out a little bit before the interviews. And then, you know, we just kind of like built that friendship. So, yeah. you know, awesome, cool, cool guy. Obviously, he's built an amazing brand with Quest. Um, yeah. And in, 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 I'm, friends with, I'm friends with Lisa, his wife. Yeah. Um, even Impact Theory. Amazing. I, mean, I love like, what they're doing. What he's doing is like, he like, again, like, I don't know how they grew. So, like, well, he he's really he's also huge on on uh on youtube he is he's got like a laser focus he's, he's so intense it's crazy i love it yeah. so i love that about him i like it too because it's not it's rare yeah you don't find people like that and it, uh, you know genuine i think for me it's like i i just don't like Bullshit. dealing with yeah exactly yeah me neither. you said it the way i, I would love to say it yeah, 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 it's, yeah. it's just i i don't like dealing with crap um you know, it's like, I don't really care about showy stuff anymore. Yeah. And it's like, now it's like, let's just be real. Like, if, let's be friends. And like, I want to hang out with people that I, I think I could vibe with. Yeah, totally agree. And it's just like not worth my time or energy. I totally agree. You know, what's interesting. What I, it, it's very, I like, what's like very nice about you is that you said, you said it like, I feel like in the world of social media or content creators or whatever, there's also this like weird, like energy where it's like a, uh, arrogance of some kind and i don't know uh, why it is yeah it's unbelievable i went to a influencer party yeah oh my god in la this is uh maybe six or nine months ago i was invited well i wasn't invited but i was with uh, a guy here a podcaster here and he was like hey let's go to this thing and i was like okay i'm always down to network and yeah. meet people whatever i don't like networking because i always feel like that's also fake but yeah. i was like whatever i'll go with you and kind of see what it's all about we go to this influencer party and man i sat in the corner the whole time because everyone's just like they're showing their instagrams oh. how many tiktok views you had this and that and i was like oh. this is stupid like this is so stupid and i was like yeah it's a cool game it's just not my game it's not your game exactly i just exa but how that game to me is so frivolous and vapid that's what i don't understand like then you're building these relationships with people who are like it's based on like nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> like literally nonsense. Yeah. And the f how are you? Uh, by the way, is it working? Yes. Oh, okay. I, just wanna, I, I don't know if we can. Even, I just want to say like, how are you even able to? How did you even remove yourself of that? Like, because even to build YouTube, like, how did you even build it? That's like a hard. Like, I I try to like I've even tried like I I started to do this YouTube stuff. And it's really hard to get traction on it. Like you can have traction on other things, but to yeah. get traction on YouTube, it's so hard. It's really tough. And I think number one is the genuineness. And number two, just being okay, having an opinion. And I think that, so true. I think that was like my thing, especially early on was I really didn't care. I, I, I was very open. I said, I'm not making these videos to make friends. I'm right. making these videos to help you with your money. You can benefit from it. You can watch somebody else. I, it, I'm Doesn't here matter. just to help you. And I'm going to tell you based off of my experience. And that's all that I know. I, I can't speak from your experience. I can't speak from anybody else's experience. I can tell you from my experience. If you resonate with it, great. If not, you know, I hope you can find help somewhere. And that was always my premise that I'm just going to 
give you my advice. And I think that's, or not advice, but education. But I think that's what really resonated with people was that I was just honest. Um, I said what I didn't know. Um, I said what I had experience with. I said where I haven't had experience. And I think that was one of the things that allowed me to grow and consistency. Um, because I first put up my first video in 2015. I got consistent in 2016. My channel went viral, I believe, in 2017 or 2018. Oh, wow. And it went viral because a video that I released in 2016 popped off like 18 months later. So it was... What video was it? I think the title is You're Guaranteed to Go Broke If You Do This. And the topic was essentially, and this is back in 2016 now, where I talked about inflation. Now, today, oh, wow. inflation is much higher. It's a yeah. much bigger concern. But back then, it was 2 to 3%. And I talked about how inflation is keeping the average person broke because we're keeping our cash in a savings account, yeah. which is earning nothing. Back then, it was 0.01%. Well, inflation is 2 to 3%, which means if you save money in the bank, you're losing 2 to 3% of your savings value every year. If you have a million dollars, you keep a million dollars in the bank, you lose twenty to thirty thousand dollars worth of value in one year, and that video was like the first I think exposure for someone learning about inflation in a cool way because I, like back before that there was no financial education on YouTube, and that resonated with people, and yeah. that then grew quickly, which then helped the channel start to really grow. So, so basically, you you basically said do this. And you're guaranteed to, to go broke. So is it your tagline that was working well? Like, is it that you, you, well, not tagged it. Is it like the, yeah, the name of the video was catchy, but it wasn't catchy initially. It, it was only catchy. catchy 18 months later. The video had probably 500 views for 12 months. And then once it started getting traction, maybe 18 months later, it grew to a hundred thousand views in like 30 days. Yeah. So that, that you know, that's YouTube. And now I don't know what the, uh, if that was the title when I first released it, we messed with the titles later on and stuff. But, um, it, I really go back to the value inside of the video is what's going to make or break the content. All the other stuff, the title, the thumbnail, that's the like 20%, the 80%, the real meat is in the value of the content and then you can amplify that with a good title and a good thumbnail and all that YouTube game stuff. But the value is, is really where the content lies. Because people are always trying to like play around and try to figure out the algorithm, right? Yeah. Because is there any real, like you can hire a YouTube expert or whatever. And like at the end of the day, like is it kind of, I know what you're saying. You're saying content is king, right? But at the same time, like, I know I find a lot of content that I see and it's just not getting traction when other things are so silly and dumb yeah. and those things are doing so well. Like I feel once the algorithm finds you, yeah. and, you and you pop to some extent, it just continues. So we have YouTube experts, consultants that work with us yeah. now. We pay for that now. In the beginning, I had none of that, right? It was just me putting out content and right. I, I made the videos off of my phone. Like I, I had no equipment. So like I started the channel on accident uh, because my goal wasn't to start a YouTube channel. It I, wasn't? I never wanted to be known. I never wanted to be a celebrity. I never wanted to be a YouTuber. I was always an entrepreneur. And so uh, I started the channel because I was, I was always an entrepreneur, but I was a hidden entrepreneur. And I, I don't mean hidden that I was like this undercover gem. I mean, <laughs> hidden because I had to hide it from my parents. My uh -huh. parents didn't want me to be an entrepreneur. So I was kind of doing it in secret and I got scammed in a business that I was running. I was, I was running a sock company, an athletic sock, water resistant sock, um, that I created. I Seriously. Went... Okay. So let's go back then to the beginning. Cause now okay. we're starting, I mean, even though we're going to use that, cause that was great information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, I loved it, but like, let's go back. So this is the minority. I, I, I always look at my notes when I say your name, but the minority mindset is what your name is in like, I guess that's your, that's your, that's, uh, I guess what people call me call now. you, yeah. but your real name is Jasper Singh. And your background is you're, you're actually an attorney that you just don't practice. I'd never wanted to be an attorney either. I bet your, your mom, your culture. My parents, yeah. My, I mean, I got my law degree from my parents. Yep. I, I never worked a day as an attorney. Never. Not one day. Not one day. And so 
you're, you, have no, you're no, you have zero financial background in the terms of you never went to college for it or whatever. I actually didn't get into business school. I was, I was uh, not smart enough to get into business school. And look at you now. And now you're a leading financial expert <laughs> on, on social media. You're very kind. No, it's true. Uh, and so your, so your background is law. But Nat, but you've always been very, have you always just been very entrepreneurial, like even as a kid? So as a kid, I was entrepreneurial Okay. Uh, because that was fun to me. Like okay. when I was 10 years old, I uh, started mowing my neighbor's lawns. I got a paper route um, and started delivering mail to people's uh, houses. But my parents always discouraged me from doing that. Uh, not because they were against me doing different things, but because my parents are immigrants from a state in India called Punjab. And they were very adamant on me becoming successful. And in their mind, successful meant becoming a doctor. Mm -hmm. So from the day I could speak, it was, Jaspreet, you need to go and become a doctor. (laughs) And it wasn't just something they told me. They told everybody, my family here in America, my family here in India, everybody knew Jaspreet was going to be a doctor. So me doing like this other stuff was a waste of time. Why am I not studying science and biology and all this other stuff? But I still had the entrepreneurial bug. But then when I was, uh, got a little bit older, I was in middle school, um, I picked up this drum called the toll, which is a traditional Indian drum. And I started playing that at weddings. Well, I started playing it at my uncle's wedding, actually. That was the first time I played it. The DJ there was like, hey, do you want to make money playing this drum? I was like, heck yeah, I'm 12 years old. I want to make some money. Yeah. Um, so I was like, yeah, let's do it. So he started hiring me, essentially, to play at weddings with him. And he would pay me like $50 for a wedding. It was, it was a lot of money for me, but it was really just kind of me getting started. My parents didn't like that. So I had to then start like lying about what I was doing. I was like, I'm going to go hang out with my friends or whatever when I was actually going to work at weddings. And that business started to grow. I, got it, I started to meet a lot of DJs when I was in high school. I got to start working at weddings almost every weekend. And then towards the second half of my high school career the DJs I was working with were like, you know a lot of kids in high school. How about we start hosting teen parties for these kids? I was like, that sounds like a great idea. Why not? And so we found um, like this local Indian restaurant that was looking for marketing and exposure because they were brand new. And they were willing to work with the DJs that I was working with to host parties without charging us anything. All we had to do was bring people and we could charge cover. So I started hosting these teen parties um, the first night college, my dad calls me in the evening. He's like, where are you? I said, I'm at college. He said, when are you coming home? I said, I'm not sure yet. I'll let you know. So it was like, I had no idea. Well, where are you living? I had a dorm. Right. You didn't tell your parents. I must have told them something. I don't remember what exactly I told them, but it was like, I just had I was so clueless. Well, about, who was paying for it? Well, I had a pretty decent scholarship. Okay. Um, so my first year was pretty much completely covered, if not my second year as well. So it was, I was very like, like, so you packed your bags and just went to the dorm one day and you're, because I'm imagining if you're, your background, your culture, I would imagine your mom and dad were pretty much on top of you all the time. Yes. But my parents were also really busy working. Like my dad worked six or seven days a week. What did he do? Uh, so my dad is a veterinarian by trade, mm. but when he came to this country, he didn't have the ability to work as a veterinarian. Oh. So he had to work first as a janitor. Then he worked in a manufacturing plant. And even though he had a license right. in India, mm-hmm. now he has to come here and start working. And, and then he got a job as a veterinary tech. And then eventually, later on, years later, he got uh, the ability to work as a veterinarian. But even then, he was working six or seven days a week. Right. Wow. If he had a Saturday and a Sunday off, that was considered a long weekend. So my dad was always working there. I, I didn't see my dad that much. My mom was also very busy working. My mom kind of hopped around jobs. She worked uh, as a technician. She worked, uh, tried to work as a realtor. She tried to work in a, a lot of different industries and just kind of wherever she could land a job. And so, you know, they were involved in the sense they were like, you have to get good grades. Right. But they weren't involved in the sense of like, we're going to go to your parent teacher's conferences. Right, right, right. So they kind of like gave you, they said to you like what they expected from you. Yeah. But they weren't really like helicoptering you. Not at all. Okay, like they, I they, they, I had a lot of independence. Yeah. Um, my grandparents also lived with me. And so like I could kind of just do whatever I want as long as I brought home good grades. Right. If I didn't bring home good grades, I would get... Um, in trouble. In trouble. That's a nice way to say yeah, it. Yeah, I was going to say <laughs> uh, But, um, you know, it, it was, it was kind of, that's where it was for me. 
So I, I had no idea what to expect in college. I get there and now I'm shocked. And I was like, well, what do I do on Friday nights? Cause I don't drink and I don't smoke. I'm not really into partying. And so that's when I had the is idea. Is that because of your heritage and culture or is it just who you are as a person? Both. I mean, okay, I think they kind of go hand still. in hand. No, yeah, I, I was yeah. 17. I'm in yeah. college. I just didn't, it didn't seem very like, I didn't see the value in that. I was like, everyone's getting wasted. And then feeling like crap the next day. Yeah. I, I was like, a, I was an athlete in high school. So I enjoy the feeling of like feeling healthy and feeling good and all that. I was like, what? Well, this doesn't look fun. I know. I have the same as you, by the way, but I was, I was always the anomaly, not the, like you kind of like at our age, at that age, that's what yeah. people do. They like party all day and night and they like, do, like they're, they're hammered all like they're, that's what they do in college. Yeah. That wasn't what I did either. So I get you. It just, it just didn't, it wasn't yeah. me. So I was like, well, what do I do? And so I was like, well, I learned how to host parties in high school. So now I'm in college. I was like, why don't I do what I was doing in high school here? So I started knocking on the doors. And I was 17 at the time. I actually wasn't old enough to go to these clubs or bars, but I didn't tell them that at the time. And I started knocking on the doors and I was like, hey, can I host a party here? And I went to the University of Michigan, uh, which is a... Oh, that's what you went for, the, for, your, for your undergrad. Undergrad, yeah. That's a great school, though. Amazing school. Awesome campus. And that's where you were... In, you, that was your scholarship in there? I had a... Yep. Oh, that's great. I was fortunate. I... I was so oblivious to so many things in high school. Like you had to take the ACT and or S, S -A ACT. ACT is what I took. Oh. I forgot that I had to take the ACT. I, my friend reminded me the day before. He was like, "Hey man, do you remember the ACT is tomorrow?" I was like, "Oh crap, what do I do?" So he like he taught me his his uh, cheat sheet on how to write an essay on the ACT. It was like your first paragraph. You need to write three sentences. You write it like this, and then you you have the last sentence be indeed comma, and then you write these words. I was like, "Oh, that sounds like a big word. Indeed, that's a cool word to use." Is that still the way to do it? Uh, I don't know. Okay, but he he taught me all these <laughs> little note. tips that um, you know include all these things. So I just like I learned those things. I, I did well in school. I studied hard in school, but I was also like, my mind was always elsewhere at the same time. So now I'm trying to figure out where I can host these parties in college. And Ann Arbor is a big town and hosting parties there is expensive. Mm -hmm. The first clubs I went to, I remember the bar, they were like, we need a $10,000 deposit to host a party. I was like, $10,000? Like that is not possible. So I just kept going. And eventually I found this club that said, yeah, you can host a party here. Um, we're not going to charge you anything up front. Just give us 50% of the cover that you generate, 50% of the revenue. I was like, all right, we're in business. I don't have to spend any money. Right. If I make $100, you take 50. Perfect. Now I want you to get a DJ. And so uh, these DJs are also kind of promoters, and I know them. So I negotiated a deal with the DJs. Like, look, you take half of whatever I bring in. And they were interested. So now if I generated $100... $50 goes to the club, $25 goes to the DJ, $25 goes to me. I diluted, now from a business perspective, which I can only look back and understand, I diluted a lot of my revenue, but it was a way for me to get started. And slowly, I started off really bumpy, but slowly this business started to grow. And uh, over the years, I had one of the largest event planning companies in, in the area where I had a contract with the largest club on campus to host a, a college night every Thursday. I was hosting my own event in addition to that every month. And then I was also hosting some concerts and some shows. So it really, over the four years when I was in college, it really started to grow. And that provided me with cash, which then I started investing while I was in college. And that was what really took me over the edge, taught me about money. And that was where I was like, why the heck did I never learn about this? Because there was this big disconnect that really got me upset because my parents wanted me to become a doctor. They wanted me to become a doctor because I'm successful. What does successful mean? Well, you make good money. So you want me to become a doctor to make money. And that's the route that I was going down. There's nothing wrong with being a doctor. Now, in my mind, I'm like, wait, something's not adding up. I want to help people. But if I want to make the most money as a doctor, that means I got to see the most patients. If I got to see the most patients... I'm probably not going to be able to provide the maximum amount of value and support to each patient. And now I'm starting to pull on the brain strings on my body. I'm like, this is not making sense. Is this what I want to do? I want to make money. That way I can take better care of my family. That way I can take better care of myself and I can take better care of my community. And so I don't have to go through the same stress that I saw my parents go through. Mm. Is a doctor the right way to do that? And then I started learning about 
financial education. So I'm studying now. This is my between my sophomore year, my my junior year. I'm studying to take the medical college admission test, the MCAT. I'm 19 years old. I'm studying to take this exam to get into medical school. I don't know if I want to go to medical school. I'm all confused. And this was around the time, like right after the 2008 crash. And I'm in the metro Detroit area where real estate prices were hit the hardest in the country. And I'm in my breaks. I'm going to like these financial sites and they keep talking about how real estate is at rock bottom. And by this time, when I'm 19, I had already read a few money and business books. And I was every business book and money book that I read said that wealthy people owned real estate. They invested in real estate. I didn't know any real estate investors. I had no idea what that meant. But I was like, well, I'm going to invest in real estate if this is what wealthy people are doing. And so while I'm studying for the MCAT, now I'm starting to look at real estate deals because I'm making money from these parties that I'm hosting. On August 22nd, I took the MCAT. August 23rd, I closed on my first rental property. I'm 19. And I bought this property for $8,000. $8,000? $8,000. It wasn't the down payment. And the crazy thing is, this was a property, a 1,000 square foot condo in a good area. And a few years prior to me purchasing it, somebody bought that same condo for 150 grand. So it had gone through foreclosure. Bank after bank took it. The market had completely tanked. And now the banks were trying to liquidate it. It was listed on sale for $8,400. I made an offer for $4,000. They came down to $7,000. And um, that was when the bank said, we have another offer on the table. Give us your highest and best offer. And I was like, I don't want to lose this deal. This is kind of a good one. So I made an offer for 8,000 and they agreed to that. So the other bidder offered even less than that. I bought it for eight grand. I put in a little bit of work and a little bit means a few thousand dollars. And then I rented it out for $600 a month. And that was now my first real exposure. to that was a Barbie house? Like... Barbie and Ken, like a real a condo? Thousand, a thousand square feet. Wow. One bedroom, so one cheap. bath. It, I mean, it was a completely different time. And what's crazy is I'm this 19-year-old kid yeah. thinking this is normal. I thought that, that was just what life was because I had never seen anything else. And so I thought that's just what real estate was like. You buy a deal for you know $10,000 and you rent it out for six or $700 a month. Well, I got a quick dose of reality after that because... I learned dealing with and managing with tenants is not very easy. I had, again, no experience, right? I had no idea what I'm doing. Of course I not. have no one to go to. I hired a property management company who was borderline scam. They never signed a contract with me. They never put a lease in the tenant. I don't think this property management company was licensed. <laughs> they gave the tenant my phone number. Tenant had my phone number. They're calling me every day. This tenant was a nightmare tenant. And it was just a big pain. And so the books that I read said investing in real estate is like fairies and rainbows. You buy a property, you rent it out, give it to a property management company, and you start making a lot of money. And I was like, that sounds great. Reality was something completely different. But at the same time, I'm learning. And I hear about these real estate investors with thousands of rental properties that are able to do it. And I was like, there's no way that they're stuck with one property just being blown up by the tenant. And so I was like, well, if that's the case, I just need to figure out the system. So the first deal was a nightmare. I mean, it was a great deal, but it was a big learning lesson. And that's when I started to do another one and then did another one. Because at that time, you could buy real estate for, like, I could buy a home for twenty for under $30,000 and lease it out for $1,000 a month in good areas. How? Okay, so wait a second. So how are people supposed to be investing in real estate or any asset if they have no money in the first place. So yeah, let's back up to that. You got to have the money, right? There's a saying that says you need money to make money, which I think is a complete lie. You think it's a lie? You need money to grow your money. You don't need money to make money. You need money to pay, you know, you to eat, to have a roof over your head. Yeah. But if you want to make money, there's a lot of ways to do that. That could be through starting a business. There's a lot of ways, especially nowadays online that you can start businesses for under a thousand dollars. Name me four. Well, you can start a content business. I started my minority mindset YouTube channel with my iPhone in front of a white wall with no equipment. You can start, uh, an affiliate marketing business using social media. This all goes down to essentially social media. 
You can do a landscaping business, go out by the basic tools or rent them, start mowing your neighbor's lawns. You can start an auto detailing business. There's a lot of things you can do. You can start a labor business. You can help people move their stuff, buy and sell things online. There's a lot of businesses, ways that you can start earning money without a ton of capital. But then it's as you start to earn more money, what do you do with the money? Because I think the big mistake that people make here in America is people work to earn money to drive a faster car. You work to earn money to have a bigger home. You work to earn money to go on a nicer vacation. But what wealthy people are doing is they're working to earn money to buy another rental property. Or they're working to earn money to buy more stocks. They're working to earn money to buy a business. They're working to earn money to buy these assets, which are things that pay you for owning them, versus the majority of America is working to earn money to buy what are called liabilities, things that don't make you any money, things that lose you money. And that's why so many people kind of play in this rat race where it's, I'm working to earn money, whether it's as a doctor or whether it's as a cashier. You're working to earn money and then you have to go out and fund this lifestyle. And it's crazy. People assume that if you make a, a lot of money, you're going to be rich. I cannot tell you the amount of doctors that have reached out to me making three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year messaging me say, just breathe. I make a lot of money, but I have nothing to show for it. I make $450,000 a year. I live in a big home. I have two very expensive cars. I go on a bunch of vacations. My wife or my husband is very expensive. I have next to nothing in my savings. I'm one paycheck away from being broke, and I have no investments. Where do I start? It's not how much money you make. It's what you do with the money you make. There was a statistic that just came out, actually, where it said that like 7 out of 10 Americans don't have $1,000 saved up. Now, you would assume that, okay, you must be making a little bit of money. You can't have a big salary and not have that. Well, the, the study went on to say that more than 50% of Americans making six figures a year are living paycheck to paycheck with nothing put aside. Wow. That's so it's, a crazy statistic. And it, it blows your mind because it's like we are taught in America to go to school. Mm-hmm to get a degree, to get a job. But nowhere along the way are we taught what to do with the money. And why are we going to school? Well, you know, we're told we're going to school to become educated, to get a job. But in reality, we go to school so we can make money, right? That's right. what we think. And like, I think the, the system is totally broken because it's an archaic way of thinking. Like if you go to school to get good grades, to become a doctor or a lawyer, you can make money to have a nice lifestyle, but you're never going to get rich that way. It's a completely, exactly. It's a completely different game. Money is its own game, right? Getting a job is its own game. And that's where there's a big gap where we assume that because I got a good degree, I'm going to make more money. And that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. I assumed that your income and your grades were linearly correlated. If I got all A's, I'm going to make more money. I'm going to be rich. Now, I didn't have this greedy fascination over like, I'm going to hoard this money and be this evil money person. It was for me, I wanted to take care of my parents. Right. I wanted to give my dad a vacation. And that was, and it's funny because in my house, if I talked about money, it was taboo. I was not allowed to talk about money. My parents always told me, don't, don't worry about money. Don't stress about money because it's bad. It's evil. Like in our culture, my Punjabi Sikh culture, money is something you kind of just you don't worry about, you don't think about it because it's like bad. But at the same time, if we're working every single yeah. day to earn money, we have to have these open and honest conversations. And now what I'm realizing today is that the reason why so many people make money taboo is because we're insecure about our own money. Now, I'm not saying you have to go out and post your paychecks and all that, but what I'm saying is let's just get open and honest about what are we doing with our money? Because now we, we were just talking about social media. Instagram has accelerated this path to broke to the nth degree because now what do we do on instagram well, we want to show off these fancy restaurants like the whole idea of going to these aesthetic restaurants blew up after instagram because now you want to post what you eat you want to post your newest handbag you want to post your newest car and you want to post like fake fake wealth because to me that's fake wealth right like if you're wearing all your money you're not rich <laughs> Yeah, it's it's. Right? I, I'd rather have the money for a Gucci bag than a Gucci bag with no money in exactly. it. Exactly, right? that's exactly a hundred. But what I say, I mean, and you talk about that also, right? Like yeah. how that it's become a phenomenon. It, 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 it's because of social media, though, right? Like people. Well, it, social media accelerated it. 
I don't think this consumerism culture started with social media. No, it didn't. But there, that's a, but that's a mindset, right? Like you, yeah. there are people, and there's a whole thing about like we were, you were just kind of I think going to talk about that about how when people make the money, they go they a mindset is to go spend it on everything versus yes. taking it and buying something an asset with it and and or investing in it. But or, this is where you know social media becomes interesting and cool because. 10 years ago, there was no education on social media, right? right? And so, like, I was so fortunate. So it's kind of funny. My parents were always against me doing entrepreneurial stuff. But when I was in high school, my dad gave me this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad by yeah, Robert oh, Kiyosaki. Course. I don't know where he got it from. And I don't know why he gave it to me. But he was like, you should read this book. Now, a little kind of premise. English is my second language. I hate reading or I hated reading. I never read a book cover to cover. I sucked in English. The only reason I did good in my English classes in high, in high school was because I knew how to talk to my teacher and I would, she was like 80 years old, really <laughs> sweet lady. I would go in there during lunch and just kind of say, oh, you smell so nice today. You look, you know, I just yeah, kind of yeah, really yeah, become yeah. friends with her. Were you and, flirting with her? Just charming yeah, her? I, yeah, it was, you know, whatever. I knew how to get good grades in her class yeah. <laughs> and it worked, but I didn't read i i was so bad at it and i like if you look at like my um my standardized test scores it was like my math and science or whatever were in the top like 10 percentile my english was the bottom 10 percentile it was a complete opposite so i just didn't like it my dad gave me this book i'm like what do you want me to do with this i'm not going to read this and then so that was one thing that happened then we would go to india um fairly often because i have a lot of family there and flying to india back in the day was brutal because one, these economy class seats are just, you sit like a sardine. They don't have a TV in every seat. So you have to pretty much entertain yourself. They have a few like aisle TVs, yeah, but they're playing like these old Indian movies and in black and white that were just horrible and so boring. So you have to entertain yourself. So now I'm going to India. I generally pack my textbooks and books with me. I happen to take this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad with me. I'm sitting there bored. Nothing to do on this plane. You're sitting on the plane for 20 hours, right? So you go crazy, essentially. So you need to entertain yourself. So I decided to pick up this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I started reading it. And this was the first time in my life I was ever interested in a book that I was reading. I read that book cover to cover again and again and again because I was like, this was something I had never been exposed to. And I was like, holy crap. Like, you're telling me there's this, there's this thing called assets that can pay me? I thought I had to become a doctor to get paid. I thought, I, I, and it was that realization that was so frustrating because we're never taught this. Never. Why? Why are we not taught in school about how to make your money work for you or how to invest in money? It's just not part of the curriculum, but yet other things that we never will put to use are always in our curriculum. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of issues that I have with kind of just the traditional curriculum yeah, and the, the classes too. you have to take in order to graduate college, the amount of money you have to spend on these. To, to even take these classes. And like, I don't even see, I mean, I, I, I'm a, the people who are amazing in academics, usually, I hate to say it, are not, they don't usually, not all, not, I shouldn't say usually, a lot of times they don't thrive after call, after school, after high school or school. I do believe there is that entrepreneurial, knowing how to like street smarts and understanding like how to make money work for you. Those are the things that are necessary to actually really build success and wealth. Yeah. And you know, there's, yeah, so there's a couple of things I want to answer to that because why are we not taught this? I think the first question yeah. is who's going to teach it? Yeah. Who's going to teach it? You? I mean, <laughs> In all schools. Is, is it going to be teachers? A lot of teachers don't know money. You know, I created... So I was in a meeting earlier today and we were talking about this K through 12 curriculum that I created. And they were like, why did you create this? Oh, you did create a and curriculum. I forgot I that joking. I did. I created it years ago. But the reason why I created it was because years ago, I used to go and guest teach in Detroit public schools uh, just as a volunteer. And Detroit public schools wow. is a very rough school area, awesome kids, smart kids, unfortunate circumstances for a lot of people. And I would go there once a week to once a month to go and teach just life skills. And one of the crazy things, I, I remember this so clearly because this is when I first started to really get interested in money education because I had learned it myself and I was applying it. But I saw that no many, so many people did not know it. I would go to these classes and I asked the kids, well, 
how many of you are working a job? Almost every single kid in the class would raise their hand. The next question was, how many of you have a bank account? None. Not a single kid had a bank account. So I was like, well, what are you doing with your money? Like, how do you get your paycheck? They're like, well, we get a physical paycheck. We go to the liquor store. The liquor store owner takes 1% to 10% of the paycheck. Mm -hmm. Then you buy a bunch of candy, pop, and junk on the way out. And by the time you're done and you get your cash, you only have half of your paycheck left. And that was such a big realization for me because these kids were hardworking, just didn't have any level of financial education because their parents didn't know. Many of them, well, most of them, did not have two parents in a home. Some of these kids are uh, in gangs in high schools. Some of their parents are in gangs. Some of them don't have any parents. And it's like, wow, how do we now teach this? And by this time, I was seeing some more financial success. So I was like, well, I'm going to create a curriculum. Mm -hmm. I put together a team of teachers and I put together this K through 12 curriculum of money. It was based off of my education. And I had these teachers build an actual curriculum with like games for young kids, puzzles and a bunch of things. And I had no idea what I was going to do with it. I spent, I think, somewhere between ten dollars to $20,000 building this. No way of making money. I had, still have not made a penny from this curriculum. I completely forgot wow. that I created this, but I just offered it for free. Then it started picking up some steam because I would mention it on my YouTube channel. Uh, people were like, why don't you get this in schools? Because the teaching, p politics behind teaching and what you can teach is very... I don't really understand it, but it's very strict where teachers have to teach what they're told to teach. Mm -hmm. And so there were, uh, people were telling me, why don't you try to get this in schools, like get this a part of their curriculum? And I started that process. And then I saw the politics and how slow and stupid this political side of things was that I immediately, I was like, I can't do this. And I was like, look, if you're a teacher, principal, superintendent, and you want to take this, go against you know, whatever you're told and teach this, I'm going to turn my eye and you can do whatever you want with it. But I, wow. I just don't have, like, I have a finite amount of time. My time totally. is better spent building my own business right. and putting out my own content. So I was like, you know, this is available for anyone. It's on my website, the minority mindset.com. I forgot that, that I created that, but it's, Who's going to teach it, right? Teachers many times don't have the financial education. But financial advisors, even though they may not be super uh, successful or rich or whatever, at least they have the basics, fundamentals. They could talk about stocks, bonds, stuff that a lot of people don't even know that. You know, like like you're saying, most people are living paycheck to paycheck or they're not even thinking about how they can make their money work for them. Yeah. So let's start. Okay, hold on. I want to ask you a couple of questions Please. here. So what, tell me what the... Let's go to through the three biggest money mistakes people are making. All right. Three biggest money mistakes. I would say the first two are you're following the two S's, saving and spending all of your money. And the third thing is I would say your savings and saving and spending all your money. Yes. And then the third thing is you're investing your money the wrong way. And I'll explain what that means. So starting with the two S's, saving and spending all of your money. We talked about the spending part. If you're spending all of your money, that's very obvious. So I'm not going to go into that. The second one, saving, is I think a little bit less obvious. Because, so in a traditional Indian household, like my extent of financial education was make money, save as much as possible. Like in a traditional Indian house, you make a dollar to spend 20 cents. In what I call the traditional American culture, you make a dollar to spend $2 with the help of credit cards and lines of credit. And so like what would be considered an ideal financial household in the traditional Indian culture would be you're working as a doctor, making a lot of money, spending next to nothing, sitting in economy class, living in a small home, driving Toyota Corolla, which it's like, <laughs> why are you working to make all this money if you're never going to, you know, use it for yourself? And it was that safety in savings. But the reality is with savings is it's better to save than to spend. But why are you saving? Because if we now look at what wealthy people do, no wealthy person became wealthy because they saved a lot of money. They became wealthy because they owned assets. These assets can be their own business. It can be stocks. It can be real estate. It could be other businesses. It could be really anything. But they did something with that money. And so then the next thing people say is, well, isn't it risky to invest? And yes, it is. It is risky to invest. You will probably lose money at some point. But saving is also risky because when you save your money, 
your savings are guaranteed to lose value. And then the next question is, what are you talking about? Well, inflation has become very popular ever since 2020, 2021. Inflation is essentially the value of a dollar dropping. People refer to inflation as the prices of things rising, mm -hmm. but the true definition of inflation is the, the devaluation of your money. So inflation means the value of your savings are dropping. If your savings are not growing at or faster than inflation, your savings are losing value. So now, if you look at today's economy where inflation is still very high, if your money is sitting in the savings account and it's not growing as fast as inflation, your savings are losing value to inflation each and every day and you're slowly becoming poorer each and every day. Now, don't get me wrong. Mm. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't save any money. It means you should save your money strategically and smartly. Save your money for an emergency. Have somewhere between 3 to 12 months worth of expenses saved just in case you lose a job, just in case you break your arm and you can't go to work, just in case your company goes bankrupt. Have some savings. Save your money for a big purchase. You want to buy a car, you want to buy a home, you want to buy a watch, you want to buy a vacation, you need money. Save your money for an investment. If you want to save money to go and buy a rental property right. or to go buy something, okay, fine. But don't just save your money to save it because you assume that's how you become wealthy. Um, because like me, I thought that savings were what you could do with your money. You just make money and save it and that's you watch your savings account grow and that means you're becoming wealthier. But you need to do something with that money so it can grow, potentially pay you, or make you more money. The third thing is the investing conundrum where kind of like health, if you start learning about fitness and you're like, you know what, I'm going to get in shape, I'm going to become healthy, what happens? You get information overload. Should I do keto? Should I do paleo? Should I go carnivore? Should I go vegan? Should I work out 20 hours a day? Should I do calorie deficit? What do I do? And you can very easily get overwhelmed and say, you know what, this is too complicated and I'm not going to do anything. It's the same thing with money. Now you can look at it and say, all right, there's stocks, there's ETFs, there's mutual funds, there's index funds, there's rental properties, there's syndicate real estate deals. I can invest in startups. I don't know what to do. What about uh, my, the, the fees that I have to pay? What is the right way to do this, financial advisor or not? If you just now take a step back and you cut through the noise in health, eat healthy, work out, right? That's a, a very easy way to get started, to start exercising and eat healthier. Mm -hmm. And you, as you get deeper, you can do more. With money, it's the exact same thing. Spend a little bit less, start investing. Doesn't matter where, just get started. Find the simplest low-cost index funds or ETFs, which are just groups of stocks. It's a way for you to get a piece of ownership in America, our economy, and just start putting your money there. It doesn't have to be perfect. You're not making a lifetime commitment. You can adjust, but you just have to get started. And that's where so many people get caught up in this idea of, oh, is my expense ratio too high? Is this, this wrong or is that wrong? And then you get this information overload and you do nothing. When in reality, the worst investment mistake that people make isn't that they bought the wrong investment, is that they never got started. And you have to get started. Once you get started, you can adjust, you'll get better, you'll become smarter, but you have to get started first. That's a, that's a great analogy because it's exactly like the health and fitness business, right? Because there's information overload. And then you like you don't know what you don't do, do, do the intermittent fasting, the keto, and then you end up with like not knowing what to do and you're yeah. like, screw it, I'm not doing anything. But then... Okay, if that's the case, like you're saying real estate is the key. Let's go over something. Okay, um, so, so far we're saying that wealthy people, of course, are not just making a salary. They're taking their money and making their money work for them. Correct. So are they, so are they, what are the three things, the top three things that people should be investing in? Well, the first thing is you got to be investing in yourself. And there's a lot of ways to do that. You can start with the basics, meaning invest your time in yourself. One of the people look at ROI, return on investment. Mm -hmm. The number one best ROI the average person can take is canceling their Netflix subscription. Not because you're going to save $15 a month, but because you will save two hours a day. Now, take those two hours and reallocate that time. What can you do? Listen to educational podcasts, financial education YouTube videos. 
just get started learning. Because as soon as you start doing this, you're going to see that there's a ton of content. And that's okay. Just start. Learn about stocks, learn about real estate, learn about money management, learn about entrepreneurship. What you're going to see is you're going to be attracted to some pieces of education more than others. As you start to learn about that, maybe you say, I hate entrepreneurship, I hate the stock market, but this real estate thing sounds kind of interesting. All right, now we're getting somewhere. Then you invest in yourself by going out and buying a real estate book or a second real estate book or a third real estate book. That's when you start investing in yourself and you have to start learning. Now, the second place where you invest, I am not one of those guys that says you have to be a real estate investor or you have to be a stock market investor or you have to invest in gold. I say just what I do and you got to find what's right for you. I started my investing career investing in myself and then investing in real estate. That's how I got started. And I was very fortunate that I got started after the 2008 real estate crash when real estate was dirt cheap. Today, it's a very different environment. Starting in real estate is completely different, but that doesn't mean there's no opportunities, just the opportunities shift. Every year, there's always opportunities. It's just that they shift. And so now, what does that mean? Well, let me just say where I invest, and then you can figure out the best way for you because I'm not telling you what to do, but I'll just tell you what I do. I invest my money in five places. Number one is my own business and startups. Number two is real estate. Number three is stocks. Number four is in cryptocurrency. Number five is in physical gold. Now, again, I don't recommend what I do to anybody, but I'll tell you what I do just so you can get just kind of an understanding. In my own business, I own and run a company called Briefs Media. This is my full-time job, Briefs Media. Uh, we have free newsletters. We have a newsletter for investors, people who want to stay up to date on what's happening in the financial markets called Market Briefs. And then we have a newsletter for entrepreneurs who want to stay up to date on the latest business trends called Business Briefs. Both of these are free. I take my money that I make and I put it back into the business so we can grow bigger. I also invest in some startups because I love working with entrepreneurs. Secondly, I invest in real estate. I invest in real estate because that's where I got started. I like the idea of buying properties, renovating them, helping building communities. And on a more selfish side, I like the cash flow because when you own a real estate property and you rent it out, somebody can live there or work there. They'll pay you rent. And if you do it correctly, this rent will cover your expenses, your property taxes, your insurance, your maintenance, your management fees, and your mortgage, and put some money in your pocket. Plus, as an attorney, who's not your attorney, I can tell you, that real estate also offers some of the best tax breaks that our tax code has to offer. That's why wealthy people love investing in real estate, because it gives you so many tax breaks. You don't need to be a millionaire to start investing in real estate, but you have to learn about it first. Secondly, I invest in stocks. Now, what is a stock? Thirdly. Thirdly, yeah. I invest in stocks. Uh, stocks give you, anybody, the ability to own a company. The advantage here in America is not everybody needs to be a business owner. No, not everybody should be an entrepreneur, but everybody needs to be a business owner. And through the stock market, you can do that. And so the stock market is a very accessible way for anybody with as little as $100, even $1, to start owning companies and owning a piece of America. You can own funds like ETFs, or index funds, which give you exposure to a bunch of companies, oh, yeah. or you can invest in individual companies. Cryptocurrency is much more skept uh, volatile, much, much more speculative. If you don't understand it, don't invest in it. If you don't believe in it, don't invest in it. It is not for most people. Most people think it's a great rich quick scheme, and if you think you're going to get in cryptocurrency and get rich quick, please don't invest in crypto. That's not what it's for. Um, there's a lot of value in the blockchain. If you understand that... I lost money. A lot of it, because I got I got peer pressured into doing it. That's right. Yeah. And and please, with all investing, if you don't understand it, don't invest. Thank in you it. very much. I think that's a very important point to make because people are like, oh my god, you're missing out. You're like, I don't know what you're doing. Look, like, I made this much. I made that much. Yeah. I'm like, all right. And so I'm like, I don't. I for so long I was like, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. And then I felt bullied really uh, into yeah. doing it. And then I lost all my money. The people can be very, um, very pressuring, and especially when you're on the internet, oh. the trends and the momentum can be very influential. And it's a mistake. It is a mistake, especially when it comes to your money. If you're gonna put your money into something, you better understand it, and you better be willing to invest in it for the long time, yeah. for the long term. Um, 
So have you lost money on Bitcoin and crypto? Or have you made so money? I invest in cryptocurrency differently than most people. I buy cryptocurrency every day. It's a daily buy for me. I'm buying it for the next 10 years. And I'll tell you why I invest in crypto. I have some contractors that work for me overseas. And I used to have a bank where I had to go to the bank yeah. to wire them money. So I work in Detroit. I got a, when I get a request, I would go to my bank and wire them money. But then I was here in um, LA, San Diego area, and I got a payment request. And I hate this feeling of needing to pay somebody. I always like to pay you right away. Mm -hmm. There was no bank near me. I had to go very far out of my way, like my particular yeah. bank that I was with. I had to go very far out of my way to go and wire them money. I couldn't send it via PayPal because their country didn't accept PayPal. There was a lot of like third-party institutions that yeah. their country didn't accept. And then my contractor asked me, can you just send me crypto? I was like, oh, that's a good idea. And in four seconds, he received the money. Yeah, wow. And the fees were a fraction of what I had to pay when I would wire him money. So that was my like, oh, there's value here. So for me, I'm buying crypto. It's a small piece of my portfolio. 80% uh, of my portfolio is real estate and stocks. 20% is startups, cryptocurrency, and gold. 2% of that's gold, so 18% is startups and crypto. So it's a very small piece of my portfolio. It's what I call the speculative, more fun side of things. Um, and I'm buying it for the long term. I buy it every day. So some of my holdings are up, some of them are down, but I'm buying this for the long term. And then I have a little bit of physical gold. And gold for me is my doomsday protection insurance. Uh, it's uh, what I call saving hard money. And the whole reasoning behind this is if I were to take $10,000 worth of physical gold today, $10,000 worth of cash, go to my backyard and bury it, in 10 years, I believe my theory is my gold is going to have more buying power. Because of that, I own a little bit of gold. It's not a huge piece of my portfolio. It's just a way for me to save hard money. I don't sit there and monitor the price of gold. Again, that's just an automatic monthly investment. It just... I just buy it automatically. That's how I invest my money. So now for you as a listener, again, don't do anything that I say. Do your own research. Well, no, they, they're going to do what, you're, what you say. You, but you have to do what's right for you, right? If you copy what I do, you're probably going to lose because you don't understand it. And you have to learn. And that's why, number one, you got to invest in yourself. And it starts not by going out and buying every class or by buying every coaching program or buying every book. Just start investing your time. Watch videos. When you find something you like that you're interested in, then read a book on it. That Netflix piece of advice is brilliant because it's not about Netflix. It's about it's opening up your day and your time to actually find out what you're actually interested in doing or doing something that's more valuable so you can actually make money at it. Absolutely. I mean, that to me is like, because people are wasted. People, the, the big thing is like, I don't have time. I don't have time. Yeah, you do. You just are choosing to spend your time doing this thing. That's not really, really adding any value. So, okay. So this is, um, this is great. So assets versus savings, right? There's, you say you, you did a video. It's kind of, what is the, in, the difference? Well, let's, you talked about invest investments, the, the, how, how you invest. Um, and then you say the top five assets people should buy versus where the, the, the investments people should make different. The top five investments versus assets? Yes. So assets is different than investments. They go hand in hand. But they go hand in hand, right? Yes. But you're saying, I saw this video you did. It said, well, you're top, that you said top five assets that people should buy. Yes. Right? And then you also did this thing, which I thought was interesting, called the three top investments people should make. So they, they go hand in hand as to an and asset an investment is an asset. Right. An asset is something that puts money in your pocket. So it, it, those are two ways to say the same thing. Talking about the same, again, it's... Because you're investing in real estate and that, can, and that asset of real estate is what you're making your money off of. Right. Right. So, so it's the same thing. Exactly. Now, it's like, what do you... See, I talk about how I invest in my own business. If you're not an entrepreneur, you're not going to be able to do that. And you don't have to go on and start a business. You don't have to be an entrepreneur. There's a lot of glory in it nowadays, thanks to Shark Tank and all that. It's become very like hashtag it, it friendly is. and like. But it's a a lot it's of a work. It's a grind. It's a, such a lot. I mean, it's it's not as glorious as people make it it's seem. It's not at all. It's very stressful. There's a lot of things that go wrong. You're going to get punched in the face. You're going to lose money. You're going to have a lot of things go wrong. So it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. But, but people have now glamorized it. They have. 
which, you know, it's the right people will become entrepreneurs because you're going to feel no other satisfaction. satisfaction. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and so it's like, yeah. and also for people like me who just can't work for anybody else. Cause yeah. you know, I would be just, I'm, I'm a terrible employee, <laughs> but you're, but one thing I think is important that you said, and I think is important in general is that you don't have to be an entrepreneur, uh, to make your money work for you right. and to become wealthy. You just have to have the tools to take the money that you earn from any job, even a corporate job. Yes. And then take that money and make it work for you by it, doing these, these particular, by putting it into investments or creating right. assets. If you started at age 21 right. and if you invested $4 a day, it's about a hundred dollars a month from the age of 21 until you retire 65, 66, and you just put your money into the market and by market, I mean stock market and by into the market, I mean buying something like the S and P 500, which is an ETF. It's an index fund. Mm -hmm. It's it, it essentially means you're buying the 500 largest companies in the stock market. If you did that from age 21 until you retire with $4 a day, you would retire a millionaire based off of the historical numbers. Assuming you never invest more than $100 a month. $100 a month can make somebody a millionaire. We've seen this happen, but most of us never learn that. You don't need to be making a ton of money to retire wealthy. What you need is the right financial education, the long-term game plan, and actual action. And that doesn't mean that we're never going to see down periods. In the last century, we have seen a recession pretty much every decade. We've seen market crashes happen very consistently. But if you own a piece of America through the stock market, and this can be completely passive. You don't have to know how to research companies. There are apps that automate this entire process. What we've seen historically is if you did that month after month after month, whether the market's up, whether the market's down, whether, you know, GameStop is rallying, whatever. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you ignore all that crap and you just invest your money into these funds that give you a piece of America, you will be able to retire wealthy. Does this mean you're going to make money tomorrow? No. Does this mean you're only going to see your money go up? No. But historically, we have seen the stock market grow by 7 to 10% a year on average. After you factor in the, the crashes, after you factor in the, the recessions, it still grows by 7 to 10% a year on average, or it has. And so if you have the ability to put aside $4 a day, you can build real wealth in your lifetime, but you have to do something with that money that's not just saving. And that's where that financial education comes into play, where anybody can start. Anybody can start doing this, but we don't have that level of education. Right. It's also the psychology of money, though, too, right? Because we're so fixed to believe that if you save your money, save your money, save your money, and you're saying that when you save your money in the bank, you actually end up losing your money, especially with inflation and all right. these things. So my, I want to talk about that because I think that what's happening now, I feel the prices are so... People yeah. are price gouging like crazy. And it is now things that used to be $3 are literally now $10 within like a year. Like eggs. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, it's, it's insane to me. How are people supposed to save even or to take their money and invest it somewhere yeah. or do something with it when now like truly like it's a problem. People don't even have money to buy food for their family. Inflation has really changed the game for a lot of people. But now let's look at it this way. If the government tomorrow said, we're going to impose a new 25% tax on you, what are you going to do? Kick, scream, complain, cry, and then find a way to pay it. Yeah. You'll have no other option. So what you need to do now is first build a financial plan for yourself. The simplest thing you could do is build something like 75, 15, 10, which says for every dollar that you earn from now on, 75 cents is the maximum you can spend. 15 cents is the minimum you should be investing. 10 cents is the minimum you're saving. Mm -hmm. You're essentially imposing a tax on yourself, but instead of giving this money to the government, you're giving this money to build your own wealth. Now, you're not spending all of your money. You're forcing yourself to save a little bit. You're forcing yourself to invest a little bit. Again, your savings are not there to make you wealthy. They're there to protect you. Your investments are there to make you wealthy and your spending money is there to buy you the nice car, the home, and everything in between. 
So now all of a sudden, no matter how much money you're making, whether it's $25,000 or $2.5 million a year, you're living below your means. But you're not doing it just to do it. You're doing it because you want to build that wealth. And so now you, anytime you make more money, you're going to be investing more money. And again, there's a lot of different places where you can start investing. And it is, you're right, it is much more difficult now because of inflation. But the reality is this economic situation isn't going to just get better. And you have to get a hold of your finances because if you don't now, it is going to get worse. And it's going to be painful to hear that, but this is the reality. Inflation is a serious problem. Is it gonna, do you think it's going to get uh, better soon? What do you think it's going to happen? What's your, what's your forecast for the next three to five years? Well, let's, let's, to understand that, let's explain it. Okay. Because what is inflation? Inflation comes from the word inflate. What are you inflating when you have inflation? Prices. No, the monetary <laughs> supply. So when you inflate the, mon the amount of dollars out there, the value of each individual dollar goes down, causing the price of things to go up. The rising of prices is a byproduct of the inflation. Mm -hmm. And so why do the price of things go up? Because, you know, is it price gouging? Is it something else? Let's think of it this way. I'll give an extreme example. If the government gave everybody $200,000 tomorrow, everybody got a $200,000 check tomorrow, what's going to happen? You're going to see a line around the door for Lamborghinis and Ferraris. But can they sell everybody a Lamborghini and Ferrari? No. No, because number one, they're not going to have that much inventory. And number two, they don't want everybody to have it. So now you're going to have this line around the door for Lamborghinis and Ferraris, but then the Lamborghini dealership is going to say, we don't have enough Lamborghinis to sell. So they're going to want to produce more. Now their suppliers are right. going to say, we need more products. They're going to need more products and more raw materials. And because of the demand, the cost of each one of these things is going to start to rise because now the value of each dollar yeah isn't as valuable. So the value of each dollar starts to go down, which in turn causes the price of things to go up. Is there price gouging? Absolutely. But in a free market, what happens then when somebody then jacks up their price margins, customers are going to say, this is stupid. I don't want to keep paying for this. And a new entrepreneur is going to say, whoa, there's a lot of margin here. There's a lot of opportunity. Let me come in and just sell the eggs for half the price and undercut this person. That's what should happen. When? I'm waiting. Well, you, you have... You know my eggs were $15 at the farmer's market the other day? <laughs> Everything has become so expensive, but that's where it's not just price gouging. That's one aspect of it. But there's a lot of inflationary, like actual value of the dollar dropping pressures. Because right. I can tell you from my perspective, like cost of labor, employees has to go up because each person needs more money now. That's exactly right. But, that's, but when is it going to, the pro, the thing I was going to say to you is once it hits that place where now the price is up, it's never going to go back down. It's never going to go down. No one's ever going to charge $3 again for, uh, for, for eggs or the minimum wage won't go down again. So like, what do you do to kind of base, like to, if, so some people aren't making more money, but some people are making more money. Where does it kind of balance itself out? And what do you do? How do you save? So, or how do you make money? I'm, I'm going to answer that. I'm going to explain the economic side and then I'm going to explain your own personal financial side. The Federal Reserve Bank, who's a central bank here in the United States, okay. has set an inflation target for 2%, meaning they want inflation to come down to 2%. Right now, we're a lot higher than that. What people think that means is that the prices of things will drop right. when you hit that goal. But that's not what that means. What that means is that the prices of things will grow less quickly. Because if inflation is 2%, that means the prices of things are still rising, just not as fast as they are now. So yes, we're not going to see the prices of things dramatically fall unless we see a complete change in our economy tomorrow. Secondly, based off of this unfortunate information, what do you do? Number one, you are going to have to make changes in your own lifestyle. Means you might have to live a little bit smaller, mm. which is very unfortunate for a lot of people because what we've been seeing happen the, the, I'll tell you what the data says. People have been realizing that my income today cannot afford me the lifestyle that I had four years ago. So what do people do? They're not downsizing. What we're seeing is people are digging into their savings and people are going into credit card debt or other forms of debt to continue funding the lifestyle that they have today. That is a very dangerous move because it, it, you're going to as you rack up more debt, your costs just keep rising and it, it makes the problem even bigger for yourself. So the first thing is you have to make sure you live below your means, meaning you have money to invest and save every month. 
So lifestyle adjustment. Second, you got to work to earn more money, period. In, uh, here's what inflation has done. A few decades ago, we'll go back to the 1970s. Households were generally one income households, mm -hmm. meaning one person went to work, generally the man, that's just how it was then. And that one income would then support buying a home, buying a car or two, sending your kids to college and living life generally financially okay. You know, you'd have some financial stresses, but it was okay with one income. Today, we have two income households. The man and woman are going to work and people are struggling to buy a home, struggling to buy a car. Why? This is what inflation does. Now, if you think that 30 years from now, it's going to be back to what it was, you're living in a fantasy world. So in this situation, what do you do? You have to one, manage your own money. And then two, you have to earn more money. How do you earn more money? Well, this opens up a whole new can of worms. Can it be from your job? Can you work harder to get a raise or promotion? Can you get a second job? Can you work to change careers? Can you get a certificate? Can you go and do something that will allow you to earn more money? If not, or if that's not your interest, then like what you were saying, you can also create your own income. Now, this doesn't mean you have to drop your job and go out and start a business, but you can do something on the side. Do you have evenings or weekends free to start a side business, to start something? And it can be fun, but it, okay. you have to start earning more money. So you're basically saying people have to get a second job if they have to. That's what you're saying. You're saying like to, to put, to keep up with the prices and all these other things, adjust your lifestyle. That may mean getting a second job again. Yes. You, you need more money. Yeah. It, it, you need money to grow your money. You need money to grow your money. What do you, okay. So, okay. Continue. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no. It goes back to like, if you are not able to get by as it is, there's no other solution. It's not going into debt to continue funding your lifestyle. It's not hoping that the government is going to fix the situation. Well, what people are doing a lot of is they're putting a lot of their life on credit card. The whole buy now, say, you know, that was, it was, hold on. Buy it's now, like pay later. Buy now, yeah, pay later. The whole buy now, pay yeah. later. I call it broke now, broke later. <laughs> That's a great, it's so, great. So I'll tell you about that industry particularly. So I told you how I invest in startups. I work very heavily in the financial space. My business is in the financial space. I work very closely with a lot of fintech companies, fintech meaning financial technology companies. Mm -hmm. And over the last number of years, the fastest booming industry, like fastest booming as in growth, venture capital dollars, explosion has been buy now, pay later. And that is one industry that I have completely avoided. I don't want to touch it. I can make a ton of money investing in that industry, but it doesn't align with my values mm -hmm. because... What does buy now, pay later mean? Well, I can go buy my groceries. I can buy my eggs now and pay for it in the next six weeks. That's very dangerous. And the reason why buy now, pay later, 0% APR, all of these programs are so profitable because you know they market it with 0% APR. It's not going to charge you any interest. The reason why it's so profitable is because when you have this system where you can buy now, pay later, companies know that if you don't have to feel that pain of paying for the eggs today, you might buy the eggs and the milk, or you might buy the couch and the TV, or you might buy a lot more things so they can sell you more stuff. And then they also know that when you, I'm going to take it away from groceries. I'm going to talk about electronics because it's a very big there with 0% APR. When you buy the thousand dollar phone with 0% APR, you buy the TV 0% APR, and then you buy the sofa 0% APR. These companies also know that you're going to buy bigger. Because if you had to pay for it out of pocket, maybe you wouldn't buy a brand new $1,000 phone. Maybe you'd buy a used $250 phone. But because it's only $50 a month, all right, now you can buy a TV as well and a sofa. Now you have more stuff. And now you have to pay more. And what happens now is, number one, you buy way more things. But then number two, a lot of people overbuy. And now you get into this game of, oh, crap, my payments are too much. If I don't make the payments within the 18 months or whatever my timeline is, now you get slapped with a huge penalty. Now it's not 5% interest rates. We're talking 18, 20, 25, 30, 35% interest rates because you couldn't wow. pay it off in time. And that's why these programs are so profitable. Borrowing money has a cost. There's a reason why banks don't give you a mortgage with 0% interest rates because they'd be losing money, right? Banks have a cost to borrow money. 
So if a company is going to give you money for free with 0% APY or APR, there's a reason why. And the reason isn't because you're a financial genius and you discovered the secret hack to have extra money. It's because they know how to get you to spend more money. And this is where you need to be financially smart. Not overspend. Buy what you can afford, especially when we're talking about liabilities, things that don't make you money. Buy what you can afford there and invest aggressively. I call it a decade of sacrifice. If you really want to become wealthy, you got to go through a decade of sacrifice doing a bunch of crap that people will not be willing to do, living below your means, and working to earn more money, not so you can drive a better car, but so you can invest more aggressively. If you do that for a decade, and that's a long time, right? This isn't a six steps to six figures secret system. This is the decade of sacrifice to become actually wealthy. If you do that for a decade, you are going to surprise yourself because now you're going to build a financial foundation. You might have built a new stream of cash flow, and now you can start living your life, buy more things that you want, and not have to worry about the price. But in order to get there, that sacrifice is not something that you can go around. And I can tell you this from experience because the first time I made $100,000 in a year, I was in school at the time. I was living in in an apartment where I paid less than $400 a month. And the reason why was because I didn't have a room. I slept on the living room floor. I would take my mattress out of the hallway, drag it into the living room, put it down, put my sheets down, go to sleep, pick it up, and go to work and go to school. Right? I, I was in the business when I first started making money of just buying real estate. I made money not to buy, a rent, not to buy an apartment complex, not to buy a home, not to have net, fi- fancy clothes or shoes, not to go on vacations but to buy rental properties. I spent money on nothing. I would go out to eat with my friends and I would only drink water because I wanted to hang out there, but I don't want to pay for the meals. I don't want to spend that money. I made a rule with my friends that I'm not going to go on a vacation unless I'm getting paid to go on a vacation. So I was in the event planning company that I told you about. I was also working at weddings. And sometimes I got lucky and I would get invited to go to a destination wedding where a couple would pay me to go to a different city. That was the only time that I would go on vacation because I wasn't going to spend money because when I learned about, I, li- I kind of live in these extremes. When I first started making money, before I learned about financial education, my money went all to my car. I was tricking out my car. I put like HID lights, new sound system, subwoofer, tints, rims, everything on my car. Then I started learning about money and I went from zero to a hundred and I stopped spending money on everything. Unless it was going to make me money, I didn't want to buy it. Now, all of a sudden, the game was make money, buy rental properties, period, nothing in between, no exceptions. So I went from one extreme of spending all my money on looking cool to all my money on buying these assets. I had shoes that I had duct taped because they were falling apart. The sole and the shoe had fallen apart. So I I duct taped it together and I'm hosting these parties, buying rental properties, but my focus was just building these assets. Right. So you're going to have to make that sacrifice. It's, you know what it's called? It's called delayed gratification. Yeah, that, that's a simple way to put that's, it. <laughs> that's what it is, though. And again, it's all about, this is, the, all these analogies are great for like the health, the, for the fitness business too, right? Like you have to like have pain up, up front to, to reap the rewards later yeah. on. That's with everything in life. But everything now, I think especially with uh, social media, it's all about instant gratification. Oh, yeah. Right? So you buy the nice Gucci bag and you buy the Rolex watch, right? Yeah, you got some nice stuff, but then you're like poor. You really are. You're poor later on. Like it's a, it's a, that's, that's what I was saying. It's about reframing in your brain and also figuring out what you really want out of life, right? 100%. Do you feel that it's easier or more difficult to become rich now for like 2024 than it was 10 years ago? It depends on the person. If somebody has the mindset to become successful, it's easier because you have access to so much free education Mm -hmm. that was not around 10 years ago. For somebody who doesn't have that mindset, it's become incredibly more difficult because social media is going to flood your feed with this is how you need to live your life. This is what you should be buying. This is how you should be looking. Uh, When in 2021, my wife and I were living in Chicago, downtown Chicago, beautiful city um, for a month. And there's a street called Michigan Avenue where all the nice stores are. Rolex, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Burberry. And that was around the time where uh, stimulus checks were being sent out as well. Oh, yeah. And the interesting thing, this is so such an interesting time because on one hand, our economy was technically in a recession or coming out of a recession. But at the same time, luxury brand retailers 
were breaking record sales. How is this making sense? If we're in a recession or coming out of a recession and luxury brands like Louis Vuitton are breaking record sales and record profits, something's not adding up. And we will go down Michigan Avenue, my wife and I, for walks on Wednesday afternoons, right? Middle of the day. And there will be two-hour lines at Burberry, at Gucci. And I was like, something's not adding up. It's Wednesday at 11 a.m. And you have a two-hour wait to enter Gucci. Number one, that costs a lot of money. And number two, how do you have the time, if you have this type of money, to go and stand in line for two hours to buy a $3,000 handbag? Yeah, exactly. And what's your answer? Well, you better get smarter with your money. I want. Well, that's like, I, I use the same thing with like in LA, we have something called Era One. It's like a grocery store. It's like the most expensive grocery store in the world, okay? Uh, Literally. I've never been there. Um, it's ridiculous. It makes, have to go whole, check it, out. it makes Whole Foods look like, you know, downtown India. I'm oh, you're kidding you. me. No, I'm not. It's like unbelievable. And I'm like, it's packed in there. You literally can, like, you can't move. It's like you're like cattle in there. And they're charging like $25 for like a thing of strawberries. It's insane. Is that where your eggs are from? Yeah, no, no. My <laughs> eggs were from like some lady at the farmer's market. They used to be $8. And now wow. with, the, with like, with after COVID, it's now 15 And I, yeah. I'm like, it's never going to, I think what happens is people see other people doing it and they're like, I can get away with it too. Like, I think there's a lot of that, but that's a whole other podcast. But, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, what I was going to say is like, I, I say to myself every day, I'm like, out of the principle alone, I would never shop there because I, I know that's insanely priced the, the era one stuff, but it's packed. Like who's p- spending this kind of money on like, you know, on anything, like they'll charge you like for their food, like $20 for a chicken breast, like a, a cooked chicken breast. But there are people out there that are doing this. And I, I don't understand, like, is it, I feel like it's, because also very social media, like it's always very Instagrammable and like influencers are there and celebrities go there and blah, blah, blah. Um, why was I telling you this? Oh yeah, you're talking about like the, how on Michigan Avenue, these, these stores, these people, uh, it, it's mind boggling to me. Because I feel like that, how are you ever going to actually build true wealth if you're literally spending every dollar you make on even at a grocery store? The saying is, when the tide goes out, you see who's been swimming naked. Yeah. And so when things are good, money but is free But it's not good flowing, right now is my point. And we're starting to see that shift. We're starting to see that shift where we're seeing the economy slow. Inflation is still around. Interest rates are rising. Credit card payments are rising. Debt levels are rising. We're seeing a shift, right? 2020, things completely changed with the pandemic. Money entered our economic system faster than we've ever seen with stimulus. Yeah. And not just stimulus checks. I mean, stimulus for people, stimulus for businesses, stimulus for corporations. I mean, just money flowed into our economy faster than we had ever seen ever in 2020 and 2021, which naturally created a boom. If you were given millions of dollars... You're going to hire people. You're going to grow because you got this free money. And that's what happened, right? People got money. Businesses got money. Everyone had money. So 2021, the economy boomed. Everyone was just like yeah. living high and, and, and living great. Living high in the hog or whatever that, that thing <laughs> that they say. 2022, it started slowly. We started to change that. Now in 2023, we're starting to actually see kind of like, oh, things might be slowing down now. And this is where now you're going to see, again, who's been swimming naked. As the economy is going to condense, as the economy slows, as things change, we're going to see a a change in the entire environment. And that's where, again, that financial education becomes so important. Because if you don't understand money, you become subservient to the people who have money. But if you understand money, then you can take better care of yourself, your family and community in all times and not get caught up into this whole social media flex culture. A hundred percent. It's also ex- the idea of exchanging time for money, right? Cause there's a ceiling on that and Absolutely. changing that ideology. But at the same time, realizing even if you are someone who works at a corporate job, you can still build wealth. Absolutely. You know, and, and there's no limit to how much you can own, but there's a limit to what you can do. There's a limit to how many hours you can work. There's a limit to like how much effort you can put in, but there's no limit to what your money can do. And this goes back to now, whether you're an employee or an employer, you have to be smart with your money, which means you have to take some of your money and invest it, period. Right? This is like 
eating healthy and exercising. Yeah. That, that starts at the basics. Get started there. As you get started, then you can get into the nitty gritty, right? What is the right workout plan? What is the right, you know, diet for me? What's the right investment strategy? I also want to say, because you said this earlier, we talked about this about how, it, like, in school, it's not being taught, whatever. I think what you did was what also you started super early. Like, you bought that real estate investment when you were 17 years old. In 19, eight, yeah. That, in 19, sorry. Yeah. When you're, but like, you were already on, you were already like thinking that way. So the earlier pe- kids, if like you're, if you're a parent listening to this, like start teaching your children like about money and how money works and how they can make compound their money. Like I do with my kid, he has a car, he's 10 years old and he has a car wash business and, wow. um, and he's had it for a couple of years since he was eight. Wow. Yeah. And that's now, awesome. Yeah, no. And, um, and so, cause it's, I think it's really important also to teach people work ethic and learning about like a dollar exchange, right? The value of a dollar. And so if he wants to buy something, I don't want him to buy. I don't want him to use. He'll have his own money. But like, it's like anything in life, right? Like if you, the, the earlier that you start to embed these ideologies into a kids, to a child's brain, they start thinking about it differently. Yeah. Right. Like that's how I see it. That's why, you know, going back to what I was saying a minute ago, a uh, hundred dollars a month invested if you start when you're 21 can make or you eight or, or eight <laughs> or even ten. better i mean it, it 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 really compounds right there's three factors that will determine how wealthy you'll become time how much money you invest and the return that you get the only factor that we cannot change or control is time we can't go back to start investing 10 years ago but we can get started today right we can change how much money we invest we can spend less we can work to earn more we can change how much right. of a return we get by becoming more financially educated learning more about investing to increase our returns or pay less in fees but we can't change the time which is why the sooner you start the sooner you start to learn the wealthier you can become not that you necessarily will right there's nothing guaranteed but you can if you start sooner um one thing I wanted to ask, I, th- I was asking before we started, because I would be, I'm curious, like, is there a question or something that you see that people are really interested in, in like a younger generation, like the versus, do you get like, what's the most popular thing that people ask you at a younger and then someone more, not elderly, but older, like who's already prof- a working professional, middle, middle age? Yeah, I think the, the same question applies. It, it just asked differently. When someone's in their teens, it's how do I get rich? Yeah. Because that's kind of like the easiest and simplest way to ask. When you're in your 30s, it's how do I build wealth for my family? How do I retire wealthy? How do I retire? How do I ever achieve any sort of financial freedom? It's the same question. It's just asked, you know, in a, in a, different, a different mindset in a different time of your life. Well, isn't it because invest, investing in general is different today? Well, it is, but the the the... Or the retirement plans, the 401ks, all of that. Like, do we still, ha- is that still the way people, like people are not making money, like that, that's not, I feel that's a broken system now. Well, it's a start, right? And, and with the, 401, the whole idea with a 401k, it's, it's a tax deferred retirement account, meaning you can invest your money into this thing and hopefully get some tax benefits, invest your money for 40 years and then pull your money out and hopefully have a lot more money. The benefit is if your employer gives you a match, meaning they'll give you some free money, that's your benefit. Now there's cons with 401ks because you know you can't pull your money out. There's cons where you might have limited investment options. But if you're just getting started, again, do what's most accessible to you. Just get started. And that's where you know a 401k is a great place to start. But I do not want you to end there. The 401k was never intended to be your sole retirement plan. The founder of the 401k has come out publicly and said that the 401k has gone awry <laughs> because people assume that your 401k is all I need. I invest in my 401k, I'm going to retire rich. Right. That's not how it works. And that's where, get started with that. Then do more investments on yourself and then decide, is your 401k enough? Is that what you want? Or do you want to do it yourself? There's no right or wrong, but you have to at least get started. Yeah. What is where did where you get the name Minority Report, like Mindset? Minority Mindset. So I started uh, the name Minority Mindset because, well, I told you how, I started Minority Mindset because I got scammed in a sock company. Yeah. So before, and, and by the way, you never even told me the story. I we were launching the sock company. I got scammed by this fake marketing company who said they were going to guarantee us all these oh. sales. 
I gave them some or most of my marketing budget. They ran away with the money. I never heard from them again. I was so frustrated that I put out this class on how to launch a business without getting screwed over because I had at this time been screwed over so many times. I got screwed over in the SOC company. I got screwed over in real estate on a different deal I didn't touch about today. Um, I talk about it on my YouTube channel, my worst real estate deal ever. I got screwed over in my event planning company and a different, like I, every, I have this kind of running joke. Anytime I start something, I get screwed over. So I started this class on how to launch a business without getting screwed over. I taught it on Udemy. It's no longer there. And I did it under the alias minority mindset. The whole idea being if you want to do something or achieve something that no one else has, you have to think differently than the majority of people. It has nothing to do with the way you look. It has nothing to do with ethnicity. It has nothing to do with your skin color, but it has everything to do with your mindset. And so I put out this class. I think I charged like $7 for it. And people liked it. And they were like, hey, can you start a social media page or an Instagram page? I was like, okay, this is 2015. So I started an Instagram page called Minority Mindset where I posted the same stuff like wish things that I wish I knew about entrepreneurship, things that I wish I knew about investing, and just, just general stuff. But again, it was like whatever you could write on an Instagram post. And so people were like, can you start a blog with more in-depth content? I was like, no, you don't want me to start a blog. My English is my second language. You're not gonna, you're gonna hate my blog, but I can talk. I can start a YouTube channel. So I, that's how you started. That's how I started. I started it on accident. I actually like, it's funny because, you know, I say I didn't start minority mindset with the intention to make money and everyone's first reaction is, what are you talking about? That's not possible. I was, I started putting videos on YouTube under the same minority mindset alias. And at this time I'd probably had somewhere between 10 to 30,000 subscribers. And one of my friends, one of my best friends, he comes up to me and he's like, you know, how much money are you making on YouTube? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, you know, from your advertisements on YouTube, how much money are you making? I don't know. I, I'm not making any money. He goes into my YouTube backend with me and he goes, dude, you haven't even turned on advertisements on your channel. All you had to do is push this button and you could start making money. I didn't know that I could do that. Like I was just making videos because this yeah. was like a way for me to like talk about the things that I wish somebody would have told me. And slowly then minority mindset started to grow and it picked up more traction and that then became like my full-time thing and I did it I mean it started because I loved it and I love it and I'm very I know how fortunate I am like I get to do something that I love talk about things that are exciting to me that are interesting make that difference and I get paid well for it so I'm, I know how fortunate I am and then minority mindset was what allowed me to then build like briefs media and other things that I'm working on so it's 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 Interesting where, you know, going back to the entrepreneur side, it's if for me, I'm a true believer in value first, right? Just provide value, provide value, and the money will follow. So that's just kind of the way that I run everything that we do in business. Do you know what I love? I, we started the podcast with you starting that story, and then we got <laughs> derailed. And then we're ending the podcast with that story. Full circle. Full circle, because I didn't realize that's how you ended up on on YouTube. Yeah. It was really an accident. It was. Oh my gosh. I love that. And well, I, and now because of that, I get to meet cool people like you. Well, and, and, and I'm just so honored to, that you even said that because I think you're phenomenal and I love that you're so humble and that your, your whole disposition is just lovely, honestly. And I'm not just saying that because you're sitting here. <laughs> it's true. Thank so, you. You know, it's true. So guys, this is the, my, for those of you who don't know, his name is the Minority Mindset on YouTube. He's also on Instagram and all the other channels. Um, and is there anything else? How else do people like find you if they want to? I uh, mean, they kind of know where you are. Yeah, I mean, you can check me out on uh, YouTube and social media. You can check out uh, our free newsletters at briefs.co, uh, briefs.co slash market for market briefs, our financial newsletter, briefs.co slash business for our business briefs newsletter for business owners. And yeah, minority mindset everywhere. Yeah, I'm gonna actually like. I'm gonna actually uh, check it out. I check think you'll it love out. it. I'm, I want to get one of these. I'm gonna sign up. Um, do you have a book coming out or anything like that? I haven't had the time to write a book. Yeah, you're just too busy doing your other <laughs> stuff. Well, I, I love your information and the way you break it down is is like I said, it's, it's your way of doing it. It's, it's very appealing. So thank you. I really appreciate that. Oh, thank you for coming on. Bye. Bye. Bye.